He took my burden soul away up to bright and he gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song, and I can sing in my heart joy bells ring. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, he gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from 
You know, there's, there's not a, a new site you can open or a news program you can switch on where we're not being overburdened by bad news and things that's going on in the world. And it's, it's only fair to say that the world's gone mad. And I think we've said this for 10 years, but every year after you say it, it gets worse. And it doesn't help to just go, ach, it's okay, ach, it's okay. At some point, it affects us all in one way or the other. So with the new year coming around, it's important that we hold on to our little light. And if our little light is a, is a scripture or a verse or a chapter or the entire Bible, we hold on to it because there's not a whole, whole lot of indications that things are going to get a whole lot better soon. So I want to share with you just two different uh, pieces of scripture from the Bible which which is going to be my little, you know, bastion of good light out there in the times that, uh, you know, we are, that we are facing. In Luke chapter 21, from verse 25, There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and on earth dismay among nations, in perplexity, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea, men fainting, fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then we will see the Son of Man coming. And then in Mark 24, But about the day of the hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the day of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came. That is, how the coming, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other one left. Two women will be grinding with a handful, one will be taken, and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you don't know what day the Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch, and would not have let his house broken into. So you also must be ready. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you least expect it. So it's not a, you know, Jesus is coming tomorrow. But the signs that are out there on God's time, Jesus will be coming soon. So let us hold on to the best thing of good life that we have for the year that's ahead of us. Let us stay faithful to what the instructions in the Bible give us. And let us continue to be grateful for the opportunities that's, that's in our lives. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this time we have in our congregation to just think back of the suffering of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that we could be here today, the ability to just pray to you, Lord, unhindered, the ability to close our eyes and just come to you and know that you're listening to our prayers. We ask not only that you be a peace in every one of us, Lord. But you listen to each and everyone's prayer today, at home, whatever the, the good and the bad might be, please listen to us and answer our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we take this moment now to become silent before you, to just break bread. The body of Jesus Christ, hanging from the cross. Available to us, Lord, in, in an instance of a prayer. We ask you to be with each and every one as we partake of this. Bless our bodies, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. on the fruit of the vine we ask that you be of us Lord as we partake of this now the blood of Jesus Christ Lord that we again just ask that you be with us each each person thank you Lord Lord bless our bodies in Jesus name
place anybody in that search will end up, and that is with Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead. And by His resurrection, provides resurrection to all who put their trust in Him. He said that there is only one question that anyone should ask with regards to the selection of religion. Has anyone conquered death? And can that triumph be applied to me? He checked and he said, all religious leaders in the world have occupied tombs. Only Jesus' tomb is empty. Certainly in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Jesus claimed to have the power over death. He himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I am come to give life and give it more abundantly. He said, whoever believes in me shall never die. And he said, because I live, you shall live also. And in one statement in John 14, 19, he answered the two questions, I live, and you live as well. Now in this passage before us in chapter 5, it is a kind of, kind of final factor in a series of narratives that give us insight into the power of Jesus Christ. The first one came in chapter 4, when we saw his power over nature, where he controlled the wind and the waves. And then in chapter 5, the chapter opened with a demoniac in Gardara who was possessed by a legion of demons. We saw Jesus' power not only over nature, but also over demons. And then in our last study of last week, we met the woman with an issue of blood, and again we saw Jesus' power over disease. And here in this final portion of our text before us this morning, we see His power over death. For us to set the scene a little, let us go back to verse 21 of chapter 5. And when Jesus had crossed again over in the boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered about him, and he stayed by the seashore. And one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and upon seeing him, fell at his feet, and entreated him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her, that she may get well and live. And he went off with him, and a great multitude was following him, and pressing in on him. And you recall that the people of Gadara didn't want Jesus there. They pleaded with him to leave. And so he got into his boat and he sailed again to the other side of the lake. And everywhere that Jesus went, there was always a crowd gathered to meet him. And here again, as always, we see this crowd that has come not because specifically they want to hear his message, but because they want his power of healing. And so we have this multitude as always pressing in on him, making it difficult for him to move. And what did we learn about this man from last week? We saw that he is a desperate parent. He is at the end of his human resources. His 12-year-old daughter is near death, and he is profoundly anxious over this reality. This man has come to believe in Jesus. He has come to believe in his power. And this man is confident that no matter what happens, he never demonstrates the least amount of doubt. He comes and he makes a public 
confession of the dilemma that he is in and an open confession that he believes in the power of Jesus. And then Jesus responds to this man. And we looked at that last week and we saw that Jesus was accessible. Jesus was accessible to anybody who would come to him. He was accessible not only to the crowds. Jesus was also available to individuals. And here comes this man, the synagogue official, and verse 24 tells us that Jesus went off with him. Now it wouldn't have been easy to get to this man's house where his daughter was so ill because of this large crowd that was following him wherever he went, making it difficult to move. And then we said he was only, not only accessible and available, he was also interruptible. Jairus' temple official comes to Jesus, Jesus goes off with him and then he is interrupted by this woman in verse 25 who has a hemorrhage for 25 or for 12 years. And he, we, we went into the details of that narrative last week. And then in our narrative this morning, in starting in verse 35, they, meaning plural, the messengers that come from Jairus' house, came from the house of the synagogue official saying, saying, speaking to Jairus, and he says, your daughter has died. Your daughter has died. Now this is not the kind of news any parent wants to ever hear. Your child has died. The delay has proven deadly. Did they know that Jairus was going to find Jesus? Probably. He probably would have told his wife, his family, his friends. But now Jesus is delayed and she has died. She is dead. And this reminds us of Martha's attitude in 11, John 11:21, 11, when they sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick. <clears throat> Again, Jesus delayed. And when he finally arrived, Martha says to him, it's too late. It is too late. You could have done something if you had gotten here before he died. Now remember, these are the same people who had seen the miraculous power of Jesus. But they find it difficult to believe <coughs> that he can raise the dead. Healing sickness, <coughs> healing illness is one thing. But raising someone from the dead is quite another. And the messengers express hopelessness at this point. And they say, why? trouble the teacher anymore and the title the teacher is important for us to note we always think that jesus reputation was as a miracle worker his reputation was in fact that of a teacher his message was far more important than his miracles were. His miracles were there only to prove the truth of his message. <coughs> he was known as the teacher, a title of great respect. And Jesus is in the middle of this noisy, demanding and even aggressive crowd and he is calm. And so, that is our fifth point in our lesson 
And it is a word that we don't use very often. And that is the word, Jesus was imperturbable. A synonym, a synonym, if you like, is the word unflappable. It means calm, tranquil, undisturbed, unruffled. There could be absolute chaos going on around Jesus. Panicky messages coming, saying to Jairus, your daughter is dying. The cloud, the crowd clamoring for his attention. And yet, despite all of these things, Jesus is absolutely and completely calm, moving unstoppably in the sovereign purposes of his Father. Verse 36, but Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And Luke 8.50 adds, and she will be made well. Our Lord's perspective is totally different from everybody else around him. <clears throat> he moves in the perfect knowledge and will of his Father. Verse 37, And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Now obviously Jesus can't have this whole crowd trying to crowd into Jairus's house. He couldn't even take his 12 disciples into the house. That would also have been too much for this family. Verse 38, they came to the house of the synagogue official. Now obviously this trip to Jairus' house took a while. And I would think that the occasion with the woman was a lot longer than I took or than it took for us to read. And by the time we get to the house, the house is in a commotion. And the people are loudly weeping and wailing. Now what does that tell us? The funeral is in full force. Now this is a different kind of funeral than you have ever been to. Typically when you go to a funeral, there's a sign that says there, Please be quiet. And everybody talks in whispers. And they move very quietly. They don't want to disturb anybody. And the organ plays this kind of mellow, soft music. We approach funerals in the Western world in a very somber kind of way. But that is not how they did it in the Eastern world. And it isn't even the way they do it today. <clears throat> Jewish funerals had three elements that are unique for us. The first one is you came and you expressed your grief loudly. You shriek and you howl. And everybody does that. And it is required for you to tear your clothes. And so when you go to a funeral in our environment today, you find your best clothes. And you put on your best clothes and you go to that funeral. However, in that time when you go to a funeral and you know you are going to have to rip your clothes, you take and you put on something old, something that you don't mind tearing up. And this became so involved in the Jewish tradition that they came up with 39 regulations on how you, have to, on how you have to tear your clothes. Tearing, for example,
example has to be done while you're standing up. You can't sit and tear your clothes. You have to be standing. If you were related to the dead person, the garments had to be ripped directly over the heart. If you weren't related to the person who has died, you could rip your clothes somewhere else near the heart. And by the way, the clothes that you tore, you have to wear for the full 30 days of the funeral, the mourning period. And so you have to continue with this attitude of mourning for 30 days. You could sew it up if you wanted it for obvious reasons, but it had to be big enough that you could put your fist through. The true tradition developed that you could sew it up loosely, but it had to be evident that it had been torn. And so the people there who are shrieking and howling and wailing and weeping and ripping their clothes. The second element of a funeral was you brought in professional wailers. People who had developed the art of howling and shrieking and wailing. They wailed to get everybody else into the wailing. Agony was magnified, not shrouded in silence like we do today. And then the third thing they had to do was play flutes. And that obviously was a common instrument in those days. And so when you walked into an event like that, you wouldn't even believe it was a funeral. You would think it was a contemporary musical event. The poorest of the Israelites had to have at least two flutes and one <coughs> wailing woman. And Jesus, in his majestic tranquility, comes in. And verse 39, entering in, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but is asleep. The child is not dead, but is asleep. And in that moment, Jesus redefines death as a temporary condition. And that's why he uses the metaphor or the analogy of sleep. Sleep is a temporary disconnect, isn't it? You're insensitive to the environment around you when you are asleep. But it is a temporary situation. God will raise us. Those who know the Lord Jesus Christ when we die, the soul immediately in the presence of the Lord. Verse 40, they began laughing at him. Luke adds, knowing that she had died, they laugh at him. How can you say she's asleep? It's obvious this little girl is dead. The hours have passed. She is probably blue by now. The child is dead. How can you say she is asleep? You're ridiculous, it's ridiculous. And they laugh at him. They laugh at him. Jesus, accessible, available, interruptible, indomitable, imperturbable, perfectly calm. And our penultimate point, his tenderness, his love, his kindness. He came, he displayed power. The resurrection of this little girl could have simply been a power display. Say a word and it is done. But there is so much tenderness. The 
displayed in this event that we see Jesus' tender, loving heart. Verse 40, after clearing the house, he took along the child's father and mother. And he brought along his companions, Peter, James, and John, and he entered the room where the child was. Now this was probably a prosperous man, because he didn't just have a one-room house. He obviously had many rooms. And so he came into the room where this little girl was, and again we see Jesus' tenderness. He takes the child by the hand, verse 41. Here again, his personal touch, his tender sensitivity, and he said to her, and only Mark gives us the original Aramaic. Jesus' daily language was Aramaic. That was the language that they spoke in Israel. The New Testament we know being written in Greek. The other writers of the Gospels give us the Greek translation. Little girl arise. Mark gives us Jesus' words in Aramaic. Talita kum, which translated means little girl, I say to you, get up. Talita means a youth or a lamb. It's as if Jesus said to her, little lamb, little lamb. And this little one is still a little lamb in the eyes of Jesus. She was a lamb to her family. And that was a term of endearment. And then he said, Kum, get up. Little lamb, I say to you, get up. Do you get the picture? Jesus talking to a dead girl. And Luke says, immediately her spirit returned. She was alive, breath in her life, soul, spirit came back. Verse 42, immediately the girl got up and began to walk. No therapy, nothing needed, an instantaneous healing, an instantaneous full use of everything. She got up and walked around. There was no need for a rehabilitation. The Lord could have healed her from afar. He didn't need to go to a house. He could have said, I don't have time, Jairus, to go to your house. I have a lot of things going on here. You see all of these people around me. They need me. But what I'll do is I will call on the power of God and she will be healed. But then something would be missing here. Something would be missing. And what would it be? The tender, personal touch of Jesus would be missing. And then let's call our last point charitable. That's a word that embraces kindness, sympathy, compassion, love, encompasses all of them. And here we see Jesus' sensitivity. At the end of verse 43 he said, something should be given her to eat. Now this family is still trying to process what has happened here. Their little girl, 12 years old, she, had, she died. She was dead for a few hours. And Jesus takes her by the hand, Talita kum, little lamb, I say to you, get up. And this little girl, 12 years old, who has been dead for several hours, stands up, gets up, as if nothing was wrong. And obviously it's a time of great celebration of joy. It was ex 
exhilarating thrill going through this family. The daughter who had died is now alive again. And hey, no one even gives a thought to giving this little child something to eat. Again, Jesus' tenderness is evident. And the response, verse 42, immediately they were completely astounded. The verb means literally to stand outside oneself, to be beside oneself with bewilderment. Beside oneself with bewilderment. People don't just rise from the dead. People don't just rise from the dead. It's a common response to the demonstration of divine power by Jesus. The people in the land of Gadara begged Jesus to leave by his demonstration of power. And verse 43 says he gave them strict orders not to tell anybody about this. Now why does Jesus always give this instruction? Well, number one, he could have given it that the crowd doesn't stampede the house where Jairus and his family are celebrating his daughter coming back from the dead. Or it could have been that Jesus doesn't want to flare up the hatred that the Jewish leaders already have for him. And so in our lessons of the past, past two weeks, we saw Jesus was accessible, available, interruptible. Not only then, but also today. Jesus is never too busy to hear us. We saw he was imperturbable, indomitable, tender, his love, his kindness, and lastly, he was charitable. He was charitable. Onward, rejoicing, that great God's way. prayers. There will be those who mock 
and shout vile things, claiming that we who love Jesus are in the wrong. But in the end, you will show everyone. Thank you for this time that we have, Lord. Thank you for each and every one of us here today. Let us be able to use this lesson, Lord, for the week that's ahead. As we heard this morning, Lord, the, the prayers for traveling mercies for those who are leaving us and coming towards us, Lord. Guide each and every one in their ways. Thank you for the gift of love that you give us. And thank you for choosing us to be worthy of a day added to our lives, Lord. Let us use it wisely. 